Welcome to our Candidates Forum for Multnomah County Commission District 1. It will last approximately 30 minutes. I am your moderator, Debbie Kay, with the League of Women Voters of Portland. The League of Women Voters is a nonpartisan organization that works to help citizens make informed choices in elections. We do not endorse any candidate or any party, but rather we give voters the information they need to make an educated selection. Membership information is available on our website and at the back of the room. We thank Neil Kelly Design and Paloma Clothing for their generous contributions to our education fund to make these forums possible. Today's forum is recorded by Metro East Community Media, and this is the fourth of six forums that the League of Women Voters is presenting before the May 20 primary election. There will be two more this afternoon. All forums will be available for on-demand viewing from a link on our website, lwvpdx.org. To view the forums on local access cable TV, see the playback schedule posted on our website and in your program. Voters can also look at our nonpartisan voters guide for answers to questions posed to all candidates, as well as a balanced presentation of the ballot measure. The Voters Guide is here in print form and on our website, lwvpdx.org. You will find free copies at the Multnomah County Library branches and at the Multnomah County Elections Office. Another important voter resource is housed at the Secretary of State's website. It is called OrStar and enables you to see the financial resources for campaigns to follow the money. Type O-R-E-S-T-A-R -E into your browser. Finally, to see information about the candidates and ballot measure that will appear on your ballot, go to vote411.org. Enter your street address, and the voter's guide information for only those items on your ballot will appear. This is an awesome resource. The candidates in today's forum are running in the May 20th primary election. If one candidate for the position receives 50% plus one votes, in the primary, that candidate will be declared the winner. If neither receives more than 50% of the vote, the candidates will appear on the November general election ballot. If you have not yet registered to vote or you have moved and need to change your registration, the last day to do so is April 29th. Contact your county elections office or register online at voteoregon.org. Ballots will be mailed beginning April 30th and now onto our forum. Let me introduce the candidates for Multnomah County Commis Commission Position 1. Seated in the order they will appear on the ballot, beginning at my left, obviously, are the two candidates, Brian Wilson and Jules Bailey. For each round of questions, I will rotate the questions so that each candidate op has the opportunity to be the first to answer. And the candidates will have one minute to respond. Members of the audience are invited to pose questions. There are three by five cards available. Please write legibly on them. And I'll raise your hand if you have a question and so that someone may pick it up and bring it to me. Timekeepers in the first row, thank you very much, will signal a 15 second warning and then stop when the speaker's time has expired. And I have a gavel. Okay. Let us begin. First question, beginning with Brian Wilson. What would you like voters to know about the county commission and the county commissioner's job? Multnomah County has one of the most important cogs in the wheel of our local governments. It is the agency that invests in human capital. It is the person side of the sustainability issue. It does social services. It provides the social safety net. It also provides for public safety through the sheriff's office and running the jails and our Department of Corrections. It is also uh, famously, in my world, the um, manager of the Multnomah County Library, the nation's second busiest library system in the country after New York City Public. And the last time I was in front of the League of Women Voters, I was here asking for your support of the library district. And I'm so pleased that we were able to put the library on steady, stable, dedicated, and permanent funding for Multnomah County. The Multnomah County Commissioner's job is one of representing, of course, the district in which we're elected, but also wearing a county-wide hat. My intention will be to represent all citizens of Multnomah County equally, always with the goal of making sure that my constituents receive the services that they, re that they need. Thank you. Jules Bailey. Thank you, and thank you for the opportunity to be here today and for uh, your time in engaging in this important election. 
Multnomah County is human scale. It's the layer of government that deals most with families that need a pathway out of poverty and a pathway to opportunity. And it's for families that are very much like the family I grew up in. I grew up in a family that was shaped by mental health and addiction issues. And it's a family where uh, we rely on the services that, that Multnomah County uh, provides through organizations like, am I not being heard? You may start over. All right. The Are question we is, we had a little mic problem there. What would you like voters to know about the county commission and the county commissioner's job? Well, thank you, and, and as I'll say it again, thank you for the opportunity to be here today uh, with League of Women Voters. I appreciate the service that you provide and for engaging in this election. Multnomah County, as I mentioned, is very human scale. It's the layer of government that's tasked most with giving families a pathway out of poverty and a pathway to opportunity, and that's why I'm running for Multnomah County Commission, because I grew up in a family that was very much shaped by the kinds of uh, issues that Multnomah County deals with, from mental health issues to addiction issues, making sure that we can spend less on uh, prisons and jails and more on schools and education, uh, making sure that we're providing health care that's available to everybody in our community. I've served this community in the legislature for three terms, and as an economist, I know that it is critically important that the services that Multnomah County provide are accountable, are transparent, and are available to give people a chance to move into stable, supported conditions that allow them to thrive and allow our kids to have an opportunity and a shot at, uh, at making it a life for themselves. Thank you. The second question, beginning with Jules Bailey. What changes would you make to rebalance the spending between the city of Portland and the county with regard to social services? I think we've seen a budget that was just released from Multnomah County that is uh, an excellent step forward in addressing some of the critical issues that we have around especially investments in pilot programs in uh, mental health services. Uh, one of the things that I think we need to do is better tease out what the county does and what the city does. I was very encouraged by the Home for Everyone uh, adoption uh, a few weeks ago that w starts to get a handle on housing and homelessness services that are a core part of what the county and the city do. Right, previously we've had a city that does uh, services for homeless singles, we have a county that serves women and families. That kind of division of labor doesn't make a whole lot of sense. It makes sense to have a coordinated organization, have the county take a, better, a bigger role, and provide the kind of wraparound services in its budget that are necessary to give people that pathway into long-term success. So making sure that the county is a, a co-investor, uh, but has a, a clear sphere of influence that we're not, we, we are eliminating overlap and getting to a, a robust budget. Thank you. Brian Wilson. There are a, a range of areas in which the city and the county could work a little bit better together, but I'm always the optimist in this conversation. I like to say that they have done a pretty darn good job this last year of teasing out some of those areas. And I'll uh, point to the auditor of the city of Portland, LaVon Griffin Vallade's recent report around Agreement A that was 30 years ago that the city and the county structured that agreement. I think we need to do that again. I think we need to have another really robust conversation back and forth with the city. And I know I know the mayor, uh, Charlie Hales, has been willing to do that, and so let's get some new leadership at the county and then start that conversation. River Patrol, there are many agencies that patrol the rivers. Can we have maybe fewer of those? Uh, Rep. Bailey did mention a home for everyone. That's a great first start for the federal funding of housing. We also need to keep pointing out that we have local housing funding as well. We've got to have better coordination around that too. So those are some of the areas I would look at. Thank you. Our next question, starting with Brian Wilson. What is your opinion of the county's emergency management system? How well does it coordinate with the management systems of the cities in the county? If it needs improvement, what do you recommend? The county, uh, it's interesting, I was just recently out at the Portland Emergency, a new Portland Emergency Management Bureau headquarters that are way out on Southeast Powell, and that is a phenomenal facility, and I asked a question of the director. I said, so how uh, much coordination takes place between the county and the city, since this is such a large, lavish facility? And she admitted that the sheriff is not actually part of that conversation, which I found to be quite a stunning revelation. The county does have some emergency management preparedness. Uh, the Department of County Human Services was actually taking a lead role in developing some really great plans for how we're going to respond as a county 
to emergencies, especially around some of our most vulnerable communities who don't always have access to the information that they need in an emergency situation. We unfortunately just lost our director of county human services. Um, she's going to move back to Florida. So we're going to have to have that conversation again. We're going to need to find somebody, uh, national search probably, to replace that really critical role so that we can continue this planning. Thank you. Jules Bailey. Emergency management is a critical issue, particularly for District 1, because District 1 includes areas of Multnomah County that are in unincorporated parts of Multnomah County, like Sovi Island, that are particularly vulnerable in emergency situations. I had a chance to meet with Sovi Island residents and Multnomah County emergency management over the gas leak that happened several times out on Multnomah County, or out on Sovi Island. And Multnomah County emergency management did an okay job, but there are definitely areas uh, for improvement, and they're working through those systems. I also want to shine a light on seismic issues in this county. Uh, it is incredibly important. I'm proud of the work that I did on the Cool Schools Bill in the legislature to help provide seismic upgrades uh, for uh, public schools. But we also have to make sure that all of our government buildings and our commercial buildings are seismically safe, and we need to get a new courthouse built that will be robust and will be able to withstand an earthquake so we can make sure that we have sound emergency services in the event of that kind of catastrophe. Thank you. Our next question, beginning with Jules Bailey. When the county charter is reviewed in 2016, would you suggest that the position of sheriff become appointed by the county commission or remain elected? And please explain your answer. Thank you. I support an elected sheriff, and I believe that it's important to have a sheriff that's accountable to uh, the people directly. I do think that uh, the county commission can do a better job of planning for and budgeting for sheriff's needs so that we are able to address some of the overtime issues to have a more consistent level of staffing that, uh, that is uh, reflective of the ebb and flow uh, in our jail system. But I think having an elected sheriff is important uh, because this sheriff is able to stand for election and you see whether it's things like uh, the ice holds issue that has come up or whether it's the overtime uh, issue that's come up, uh, you see a public that's engaged directly with the sheriff and it's important for the sheriff to be able to see that. I'm proud to be endorsed by Sheriff Staten uh, in this race and I look forward to working very closely with the sheriff's office uh, as a county commissioner that's focused on public safety. Thanks, Brian Wilson. I've had the um pleasure of serving as the chair of the last Charter Review Commission where we took this issue on headlong, uh, whether we should have an appointed or a, a, an elected sheriff. And I can tell you in all of the due diligence that we did on this issue, the people like to vote for their sheriff. That's something we have a, a proud tradition in this country of doing for many years, so I wouldn't advocate for that. But I will be a strong advocate for the next Charter Review Commission to take a look at some of the uh, requirements that we place on electing our sheriff. In other words, specifically the residency and the certification requirements. If we could loosen those, those requirements up a little bit, the county would have the opportunity then of attracting a whole different range of potential sheriff um, uh, sheriff's to, uh, candidates who could run for sheriff. So I would like to see the Charter Review Commission do that. It's, it's important that we get the right kind of sheriff because our sheriff does do patrol services, but 90%, well, not 90%, 80% of his budget is really around corrections. And so we need a good corrections manager. Thank you. Question five. The Wapato Jail was built, but is not being used. Mental health patients are being jailed rather than treated. How should the commission approach these issues? Brian Wilson. Uh, Wapato Jail, let's start with that one. It's a cut bait moment for the county. The bonds are very nearly defeased on it, which means the county can now market it to the commercial market and, and sell it. We're never going to open it as a jail. It is designed as a, an outplacement jail facility to begin with, so perhaps the state of Oregon, the Department of Justice, could take a look at that and replace some of their aging facilities that serve that purpose. But I don't think that the county wants to continue to maintain that facility in mothballs. It costs the county $300,000 a year. That is money that we could be putting to better services like helping to deal with some of the people that we are now directing to jails that are having mental health crises. Um, what we really want to do is find some low-hanging fruit in this area. There are certain programs that are out and available that are HIPAA compliant and perfectly safe that can notify a mental health provider when one of their patients comes into contact with law enforcement. Instead of directing that person into the jails then, we could direct them to the mental health services that they need, get them stabilized, get them the medications that they want. But we've got to find the savings from within the system so that we can do just that. Thank you. Jules Bailey. 
in the last legislative session, I passed a bill that allows for Wapato uh, to be used for other purposes so we can start to recoup uh, some of that investment. And there are private sector entities that are interested in it, particularly, actually, interestingly, uh, as a permanent soundstage for the uh, film and video industry might be one opportunity for it. Uh, so that is in, uh, that's ongoing, those conversations. On the mental health and jails issue, the number one place people really receive mental health treatment is in jail, and that's not good for our jail system, and it's not good for the people that need help. It's one of the most expensive ways uh, that we are treating one of the most critical issues uh, in our society. I was actually very proud to see in uh, the budget uh, that was just released a, a pilot program that would directly address this issue by having uh, places that are open 24 hours, that are well-staffed, where law enforcement officials can take people in crisis so that they they can get to the help that they need as opposed to ending up in a jail where it really only exacerbates the problem. Thank you. How do you imagine the county's role in promoting economic growth in a way that benefits county residents equitably? Jules Bailey. The county really needs to start seeing a lot of the services it provides as a driver of economic development, not just a pr provider of social services. We have a lot of folks that the county has, I think, sometimes classified as, you know, I guess in the economic parlance, being on the liability side of the balance sheet. We need to put those folks on the asset side of the balance sheet. And that means connecting programs to get people not just into housing, not just the treatment that they need, but onto workforce training and workforce development programs, making sure that they're able to be in a position to get a job and have a pathway out of the system because one of the most important things you can do for somebody is get them a pathway to employment, make them job ready, and help them into a place where they don't have to rely on the kinds of services that the county provides anymore. I also think it's important that we focus on programs like Albina Opportunities Corporation Runs or Mercy Corps Northwest with microloans and entrepreneurship assistance for uh, low-income families. I was proud to help create Clean Energy Works Oregon, which has created hundreds of jobs for women and people of color. We need to make sure that the county is laser focused on preparing people for employment. Thank you. Brian Wilson. I think it's important to remind people that the county's function in our government, local governments, is to invest in the human capital. And that is part of the economic development question or uh, equation, isn't it? Because if we can help people when they are in crisis with temporary rent assistance or getting a little bit of food or helping their kids stay in school so that they learn to read at an early age, like through the Sun Schools program, that is part of creating an environment where we can grow locally our economy. Businesses want to locate in places where these services exist to help temporarily move people through from one crisis into permanent and stable housing, permanent and stable education systems, and that's that's really the county's function in this. There are some other things the county can do. I uh, was a teacher at uh, Mercy Corps Northwest for years in their micro lending program and helping people start businesses, and I well understand the county's role in helping to finance that, but there are some bigger conversations that we can have too around how do we make Multnomah County an attractive place to, for people to do business. And on that subject, what can the county do to encourage more stable family wage, family wage jobs? It's really critical that the county do that because the more people who have family wage jobs, living wage jobs in our community, that means the fewer people that are relying on our services as a county, the, the social safety net. So a real easy place for us to start is to make sure that any county contracts provide language and enforceable standards that any project that the county lets out will make sure that the people working on those projects are paid fairly. Um, it, it, again, it's in the county's best interest. People who are not drawn off the social safety net free up resources for us to be more successful as a county and the county has several very large projects that are going to be coming out of the pipeline very shortly the new health department building the county courthouse which hopefully will get built and the sheriff's facility needs to be redone and there's a lot of other things so there's it, this isn't this is an easy one for the county to enforce thank you Jules Bailey I'm very proud of my track record in the legislature in creating family wage jobs. As I mentioned, I helped be, start the organization Clean Energy Works Oregon, which has created hundreds of jobs. 56% of the jobs have been done by women and people of color. The average wage is $21 an hour, and they all provide health care. Government can play a role in setting high road agreements in contracting in making sure that people have access uh, to the kinds of jobs that lift people out of poverty, not keep them in the cycle. One of the things that Multnomah County also needs to do is play a really 
really key role in addressing the wage gap issue. We have a huge wage gap issue and a gender gap uh, in Multnomah County. I think we need to do uh, regular audits of our contractors, make sure that we're understanding the wage gap issue and holding contractors accountable and the county government accountable to make sure that we have fair and equal pay in Multnomah County. What is the best way for the county to coordinate its health care system with Cover Oregon? Jules Bailey. Well, uh, that is a, um, a fast-changing issue, um, and I think you've seen some of the headlines about the movement uh, Cover Oregon to the federal exchange. What's really important is that the Multnomah County focus on implementation of the Affordable Care Act and coordination with Health Share of Oregon and CCOs to make sure that we're actually starting to realize some of the gains that are out there, especially around mental health uh, services. You're going to see a change, potentially, in the acuity of the population that's seeking services at Multnomah County as they have more options to go to other places once they have access to health care. We have to make sure that people are, that Multnomah County is working with contractors to provide high quality health care uh, and, and is making sure that when we see savings in the system from implementation of Affordable Care Act, that we're investing in the kinds of wraparound services that provide those people the additional services that they need. So it's not just about one touch, it's about connecting the dots in a sometimes siloed system. And Multnomah County will be a really key actor in making sure that we get this right as we do this implementation. Thank you. Brian Wilson. It is, this is a so critical question. I spend a lot of time thinking about this and researching it and working with people here at the county and having these conversations. One of the first things I think we have to focus on is we, we do need to find a new director of health, public health for the county. We've, uh, since we lost Lillian Shirley almost a year ago now, we haven't had the leadership that we really want to as we head into this very critical phase of rolling out Cover Oregon and the county's role. The county is going to be providing health services to a whole group of people who are for the first time insured and have choice in where they want to seek services. So if the county wants to remain a provider of services to these newly insured people, they're going to have to make sure that they have clean, bright facilities that are well staffed and located in areas where people can seek those services. And that is something that we have to work really hard to do, which means we've got to be flexible, we've got to be thoughtful, and we also have to work with all of our partners at Family Care and and the other CCOs and in, in, in the state especially. So, Thank you. We now have a question from our audience. Do you think the public is well served by having three levels of government, city, county, and metro? Wouldn't it make sense to consider restructuring and consolidating government functions? Starting with Brian Wilson. Um, it sounds great, doesn't it, to get rid of a bunch of layers of government, but the fact of the matter is that all three governments play a very unique and different role in our community. And let's start with Multnomah County because it's always important to point out that Multnomah County isn't just the city of Portland. There is a very large area in East County with other smaller cities. We all know Gresham and Troutdale. Maywood Park, though, Troutdale, and some of the other smaller uh, jurisdictions. They rely on the county for certain levels of services, just like the city of Portland is providing to its citizens. So there's some, we can't split the county in half. There's not the tax base out in East County to support that as an independent area. Metro's role in our community is very specific. It's around energy. It's around sustainability. It's around managing the urban growth boundary. It is a large regional government. And Multnomah County is never going to be able to take on the same role for that Metro does within all the other counties that it, that it would otherwise have to. And of course, the city of Portland is what it is. It's a very large organization organization, um, and it provides essential services to its citizens as well. Thank you. Jules Bailey. I also think that it's very important that we keep those layers of government focused on what they do best and that they do serve very different roles and that uh, the expertise with which they do that uh, is important. I do think, though, that there are some opportunities for better coordination between those layers of government. I'll give you uh, an example. On housing and homelessness issues, Multnomah County and Portland pay about 86% together uh, of the cost of service for uh, homeless individuals. We are actually bringing in folks uh, from Clackamas and Washington County that come into Multnomah County to seek services, which is uh, completely understandable. We need to have a better regional strategy on how we address housing and homelessness, and that means working closely with other counties and having that at the metro area level, uh, that kind of conversation and coordination. So I think it's important that we have 
those three layers of government, but we can't lose sight of the fact that the right hand's got to know what the left hand's doing and that we have to have a coordinated, streamlined uh, form of government. Thank you. One more question from the audience. What should the county do to ensure that a lot fewer youth get into the criminal justice system? Jules Bailey. We do sometimes, I think, a better job of tracking FedEx packages than we do of tracking kids in the cr criminal justice system. Too many kids are getting lost in the system, and it is incredibly important that we make those investments early to give kids a pathway to success and a pathway out of the system. One very simple thing that uh, we can do is make sure that as kids are going through juvenile and specialty courts, that when they're coming out the other side, that we have better coordination and follow-up to understand are the plans being implemented that, that, uh, that the system's coming up with? Is there an issue in the home? Are there wraparound services for the family that's needed? And then make sure that that kid is followed up with so that when they, if they come back in front of a judge later, that there's an understanding of why that kid's gotten there, what their story is, and how they connect. This is incredibly important because we are not serving kids in Multnomah County, especially kids from communities of color that are getting stuck in the system and need a pathway out. And we can do better for it. We know it. we have the tools and know how to do it. And House Bill 3194, the Justice Reinvestment Act that I helped pass, will give us an opportunity to make some of those investments. Thank you. Unfortunately, while our audience provided wonderful questions, we are nearing the end of the forum. And at this time, I invite our candidates to provide the answering the questions. So sorry. Your turn. <laughs> I'll keep it brief. Thank you. <laughs> I do think it's incredibly important that we refocus a lot of our energies around our youth in this community. We have some fantastic programs that the county is already funding through, for example, the Latino Network that directly works with families in the home, or Q Center that helps sexual minority youth uh, find resources to help them stay on a good track where they have access to services and they can learn. The Sun Schools program, which many of you may be familiar with, that make sure that our kids are fed and that they are healthy and that they can continue to learn. Those are really important places for the county to invest its dollars. We can do a better job on the back end of it though, and that's something that I know that Scott Taylor and the Department of Community Justice work very hard every day to find new ways, and I'll provide as much leadership around this issue as I possibly can. Thank you, and my apologies. At this time, you may make your closing statements, beginning with Jules Bailey. Great. Again, I appreciate the opportunity to be here today. I've worked very closely with League of Women Voters down in the legislature, especially on issues like closing corporate tax loopholes, and I appreciate the work and the research that you've done and put into that. I'm proud of my track record my as, as a legislator, my experience as an economist, and I hope that will serve me well as your next commissioner from District 1. I've been endorsed in this race by Governor Barbara Roberts, and I look and, and every major organization that's made an endorsement in this race. I look forward to being a champion for Multnomah County citizens, as I have been for the last six years. This place is my home, and I look forward to investing in it to make it a better place. My website is JulesBailey.com, and I'd be honored to have your vote. Thank you. Brian Wilson. Thank you very much for all of you being here today and then also the audience that's going to be watching this on television. It is really important. This election is so critical. Between now and two years from now, 80% of the board members at Multnomah County are going to change. So the decisions that we make this May are critical to providing stability of services that the county provides in this community. I call myself the local option in this because for the last almost 20 years, I have been volunteering and working right here in this community and for this county, providing leadership on such critical issues as bridges and transportation, housing and homelessness. You know me from libraries, but there are a lot more things that the county does that I am very excited to present my ideas and leadership around. So I hope to earn your vote. My website is wilsonforportland.com, and I look forward to working with all of you in the future. Thank you. Thank you both. This concludes our forum for Multnomah County Commission District 1. We thank both candidates for participating in our forum. Thanks also to our timekeepers and volunteers from the Portland and East Multnomah County Leagues. Please check our website at lwvpdx.org to view all of our forums on demand and for replay dates, times, and channels for local access cable TV. Pick up the League of Women Voters Voters Guide here and at your local public library. Online, you can check vote411.org for a preview of your personal ballot. Election Day is May 20, and as both our candidates have said, it's an important election. As with all Oregon elections, you will receive a mail-in ballot. Ballots must be mailed back early or delivered 
to an official drop-off site anywhere in Oregon no later than 8 o'clock on Tuesday, May 20th. That is coming sooner than you think. Postmarks don't count. It really needs to be there on time. This is Debbie Kay for the League of Women Voters. Thank you for watching. Please be an informed voter and remember, your vote counts. Thank you.